go ahead and get started. Um, Awesome. Well, hello, guys. Welcome to the fourth and final Howard and Sandra Bender Educational Series Seminar for 2023. We have been so excited to include this as a new addition to our current slate of existing educational programs and endeavors, others being our Maryland Thoroughbred Career Program, Work Experience Program, and, of course, the Maryland Horse Library and Education Center. We are so grateful to have partnered with the University of Maryland Extension for this series and have enjoyed working with them this past year to deliver seminars on topics covering pasture management, ag and social media marketing, turf grass management, equine and equine nutrition, this one. Um, these seminars are recorded, so a video of this and previous events will be available to watch on MarylandHorse.com. Um, so this seminar concludes the 2023 series, but we will be back in 2024, so be on the lookout for future announcements. And this series is made possible by the Bender Family Foundation, University of Maryland Extension, our speakers, and you. So I'd like to give a big thank you to everyone here with us tonight, especially Jen Reynolds and Dr. Amy Burke, um, who have played a big part in making this series a success. So before we get started, yes. Definitely. <laughs> so before we get started, just some general structure for the evening. Um, Michelle Jennings will start us off as our first speaker. We'll do a break for refreshments, and then Dr. Amy Burke will come back and be our second speaker. Um, so to introduce Michelle. Michelle Jennings began riding at five years old. It was working with her horse, Jason Castle, who struggled with many digestive problems that sparked her interest in equine nutrition, and she went on to pursue her college degree in equine science with an emphasis on equine nutrition from Wilson College. Since graduating, she has worked extensively with widely, several widely respected equine nutritionists and equine feed companies. Today, Michelle continues her work as an equine nutritionist, equine department manager, and part-time owner of the mill. So, welcome. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Michelle, as Becky just told you. I have been with the mill, back at the mill since 2007. And I am here to talk a little bit about the equine digestive tract tonight and some feed management tips. Okay, so this is who I am, phone number, email, all that good stuff. As you can see, we've got <clears throat> some lovely pictures of the digestive tract of the horse behind here. And we'll just go ahead and kind of jump right in. Um, the first thing, the equine digestive tract, it's got two parts, the foregut and the hindgut as we know it. And in each of those, there are different parts. Um, you know, we're gonna go through each one, but in the foregut, that is kind of where our soluble, non-structural carbohydrates, a lot of our proteins, fats, and nutrients are digested. And then we get into the hindgut, which is more of the fermentation vat. That's why it's so important we feed horses fiber and good hay, which Dr. Burke is gonna share with us next. Um, the hindgut is gonna be your cecum, your large colon, your small colon, and your rectum. So that's kind of the base of, of the horse's digestive tract. Make sure I'm going, okay. So I kind of like this picture, guys, because it shows what a small area that all of this it actually fits in. And since I've got a group of adults tonight, I am going to show you what I have in my black bag to start with. And as we go through, we'll actually be able to talk about it a little bit more live and in person. So this is Clyde. He goes with me to bury all of my talks about the digestive tract. And it was an actual horse of a customer of ours that they donated. So it's, it's kind of cool. And it shows you how basically 100 feet in length of something has to fit in such a small cavity. So that's why we have a lot of digestive problems, which I'm sure most of you having horses have dealt with in one way or another. So digestion starts obviously in the mouth. You know, the lips draw the material up in. We know horses don't chew like we do, right? They chew in a circular motion. Why do they do that? It helps reduce the size of the material, breaks it down, um, and helps all the enzymes start to digest it. 
Um, in the mouth is where the saliva happens. Does anybody have any idea how much saliva a horse can produce a day? They can produce up to 10 gallons, believe it or not. It's kind of crazy when you think about it because the amount of water they drink is somewhere between eight and 10 gallons. So when you think about how much saliva they can actually produce, and one thing that saliva really helps with is buffering the pH in the stomach. So it is huge that a horse is chewing. So, you know, I'm sure we've all heard the fact horses need to continually graze. Well, this is part of the reason why, is to keep that saliva and keep that lubrication going. Again, you can see the picture of this horse and how everything fits in a very small cavity once we get past the esophagus, which that's gonna be the next part. So the esophagus is, sorry, right here. It is basically what takes the food from the mouth. Oh, goodness gracious, the small intestine's giving me a fit. There we go. <laughs> into the stomach. So remember, it goes one way, right? Horses can't vomit. And that is because of this little part right here. It will not come back up. Once it goes down, it has got to come out the other way. But again, this is the esophagus. Basically, it doesn't have a big job except to get the food into the stomach, which here is our stomach. So you can see how small it actually is when you think about a 1,200 pound horse. So when we look at the stomach, the stomach is broke, and this is a, I think this is a pretty good, oop. Sorry, I forgot about the cardiac sphincter. That's what we were talking about, the piece that connects the stomach to the esophagus, right? And that's the piece that will not let backtrack happen. No vomit. Oop, wrong way. Okay, so we get into the stomach, which I showed you guys. It's pretty small. It holds about two to five gallons at a time. That's why we always say when we feed a grain meal, the general rule is no more than five pounds at a time because it, it doesn't really fit very well. Um, you know, we know there is a glandular region and a non-glandular region. The glandular region is the top part of the stomach. That's where we're going. Um, I'm sorry, that's the bottom part of the stomach. The non-glandular is the top part of the stomach. And that is where we've got um, the ulcer problem that we all talk about in the stomach. That's where more of your ulcers are gonna be located is in that top part because it doesn't create the pH and balance it as well as the bottom part. Um, stomach really, the feed goes through it pretty quickly. Um, takes about 15 minutes. So really goes in the mouth, goes down the esophagus and leaves the stomach. So that's a rare, a pretty quick procedure when you think about the whole digestive tract. Anybody have any idea how long it takes from the time it goes in the mouth until it forms into feces and comes out the other end? 70, it can take up to 72, 48 to 72 hours, usually. Now, some things will make that change, but that's, that is the norm. So that's kind of, kind of the stomach. Does anybody have any questions about the stomach? Like I said, it's pretty, when you actually see it live and in person, it really is pretty small. And then the next part we're gonna talk about is our small intestine. The small intestine is about 70 feet and it's broken down into three parts. Well, that's what connects it, sorry guys, the pyloric sphincter. Um, oh, thank you. Um, so again, it's about 70 feet long. This is where a lot of the digestion or breaking down occurs. Your carbohydrates, your proteins, some of your fat, a lot of your nutrients, um, it's gonna hold anywhere from 10 to 23 gallons, and it can take anywhere 
from 45 minutes up to eight hours to go all the way through, just depending. So you've got three sections of the small intestine. And each section does something a little bit different. But you can see why we have such a hard time with the digestive tract. I can't even get one out on a table and get it laid out without struggling. But again, 70 feet, 10 to 23 gallons, broken down into three segments. Um, you know, your first segment helps with the bicarb, helps balance the pH, helps protect the stomach lining. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> your second segment is where the nutrients are gonna start to get digested. And then your third segment is kind of where the junction starts. And again, secretes more, more bicarb to help with the pH. You guys can all read, so I don't really need to read anything to you. But that's kind of the small intestine. This is, a lot happens in the small intestine before we go back to the hind gut. And it, again, when you start to think about that body of the horse and you start to think in between the shoulder and the hip, most everything on the, the table and some on the floor has to fit, it really makes us understand a little bit more why horses have such a difficult time with digestion and why we have problems such as ulcers, colic, all of the things, right? So we've got another valve, an ileocecal valve. There are a couple of these. This one is gonna connect the small intestine to our next piece, which is our cecum. And our cecum, is where, oh, she put that slide in first, so let me go to the cecum first. Okay, the cecum is where the hindgut starts. It's where all the fiber digestion begins. We talk about horses being hindgut fermenters. This, this is why. Um, it's about four feet long. It holds uh, seven to 10 gallons at a time. Um, it moves feed through. It has very strong contractions. Uh, again, this is where all the fibrous material goes. So this is where all of our hay is gonna go, our structural carbohydrates. And again, everything kind of gets mixed here. This is where the good butt bugs go to work or the good microbials go to work. Um, and we talk about what can go wrong when the good bugs or what the good bugs do and what happens when the pH drops. So this is, this is super important when we're starting to talk about a horse being a hind gut fermenter, right? Um, we've got to keep the pH in their diet balanced. How do we do that? We try to let them graze as much as possible because by nature, that's what they do. We try to break their grain meals into more than one meal a day. Um, because what happens when the pH drops in the gut, it's gonna kill out, it's gonna kill the good bugs off. And what happens is then toxins get released and that's when we start, they, and then they go into the bloodstream and that's when we start talking about laminitis and colic. That is why it's so important that these bugs in this hindgut stay happy and the pH stays happy in the hindgut. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, here we go. We've got, an, we've got another ileocecal valve, and this connects every, the cecum to the large intestine. So what is encompassed of the large intestine? We've got the large colon, the small colon, and the rectum. It, it's gonna hold up to 20 gallons, and it is, again, the rest of our digestive tract until the very end. So we've got the large colon and the small colon. Oh. 
And basically what happens here is the rest of the fibrous material is gonna get broken down and digested and utilized. This is where the water, the electrolytes, and our volatile fatty acids are reabsorbed and turned into energy a lot of times. And by the time it leaves the large colon and heads to the small colon, pretty much everything that's going to be digested and absorbed has been. Once we go into that small colon, that's when the water, the rest of the water is going to get taken out. Um, and then we go into the rectum, which is where everything gets formed into fecal balls that wasn't absorbed and passed through. So that's the down and dirty of the digestive tract and kind of how it works. Again, you can, you can see it and you have to figure this table is probably longer than the shoulder to the hip. And I've kind of got it all thrown up there. And when we looked at that first picture, that's kind of what it sort of looks like. It's just all kind of shoved in there. I'm sure some of you have seen colic surgery before <laughs> when they open a horse and they pull everything out and they put it back in. Kind of looks like that on the table. So that is, again, the, the quick and down and dirty of, oh, thank you of the digestive tract. I am struggling. My whole family has had some kind of respiratory fun. Uh, <clears throat> can I answer any questions about how it works? So it is, it, it's kind of like a, oh, sorry. <laughs> they asked me, how do we preserve the intestinal tract that I carry around with me? Um, basically, it's tanned. It's a lot like a pig ear, and that's what it feels like. Like right now, my hands are so greasy, I don't wanna touch anything or anybody because it's gross. Um, this is where the kids, when I talk to kids groups, they come up and they're like, oh, and then they're like, ew, this is gross. But yeah, that's kind of what, like the best way I could describe it is it's tanned and it feels like a pig ear. Yeah, I've had it with me for probably about 15 years now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and this was a full size. He was about a 1,300 pound horse. So it has been a wonderful teaching tool, but yeah. I've got a more technical question, I guess. Where often do you see colic, I mean, which part, large colon, small colon, the colic issue or the impactions happen? You see that more in the hind gut. You know, that's going to be more in the hind, hind gut side of things. And, th and that can come like, you know, you mentioned impactions. Um, and, and where does the colic happen in the hind gut? And a lot of times that's a hydration issue. Not all the time, but a lot of times. You know, that's what we tend to see. And... <laughs> Uh, that's the kicker. Like I said, when you sit down and you really look at how much has to fit in such a small compartment, I'm always amazed that we don't have, knock on wood, more problems. Because I feel like we should. When, when you really look at them and kind of the design of them and, and how they were made. Sure. I have a question about ulcers. So, <laughs> Scope and, but, uh, this is just, 
Crazy. So the ulcers they would find would be in the small intestine. <laughs> So the question, so the question you're asking is, no, no, it's okay. So the question you're asking is, where do they find the ulcers? Is that well, what, skin, or, yeah, it okay? Goes down, it, only goes into the small. it goes into the stomach. Goes so the down. scope goes into the stomach, and then there are two compartments of the stomach: the the, the glandular and the non-glandular. So if we hold on, I sh if I can work this. Oh, look at me go. That's impressive. Okay. Okay. So when we look at the stomach, we've got <clears throat> the glandular region, which is the lower part of the stomach. Usually we don't see ulcers in that, in that region. Usually it, they're in the top part of the stomach. You, again, usually. Every, right, everybody, there are different things, but that's usually where we see them. So I, I'm not, yeah, I, I'm not exactly sure what they weren't able to get past with the scope. I don't think they could get to the lower, the glandular part. Is that where they would normally go also with the scope? It seems like a... uh, I'll be honest, I, I'm, not, I'm not a vet, but the times I've been part of scoping, we're always looking at that top part. We're always looking at. I wonder if it was a problem in the esophagus. No, that's through the esophagus. Okay. Hmm. Any more questions about the guts? Oh. So <clears throat> we kind of put this together as just a basic kind of horse one, 101 and why do we have some of the problems that we do, um, you know, some common common issues, a little bit of history. Um, you know, the big thing about a horse is they were prey animals, fight or flight, right? They, 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 they tend to run. Um, they're continual grazers. Again, that's what that gut is made for. So it, it you know, it makes sense. They're going to graze 20 you know, 16 to 20 hours a day if left to their own devices. Now, they're not gonna graze on the type of pastures we have for them, right? When you think about horses in the wild, they're not eating what our horses are eating. Um, so that's why they graze. They also have a lot of physical movement. We know, we know the horses are better when they can move more too from a, from a digestive standpoint. So that's just kind of a little bit of, of how they were designed and how they were made. And I think a, <clears throat> a lot of people forget that. We lock them in boxes, we feed them big grain meals, and then we wonder why we have some of the problems we do with the digestive tract. Well, if you look at kind of how they were made and how we've evolved them, it definitely, it definitely sets itself up sometimes for problems. So that, that's why we kind of threw this in here, is it just gives us a little bit of a thought process when we think about colic and ulcers and some of the problems that we have 
helped create sometimes. Um, again, here are some of our common issues that we talk about, colic being a big one. There are lots of types of colics, guys. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with them. Cricket brought up impaction. You've got parasite issues, lack of hydration, you know, moldy or tainted feed or forage, medications that we've been on too long, ulcers are a big one, we've touched on those. You know, what we've learned is lots of horses have ulcers and we don't necessarily know why, because why does the pony in the field that lives outside that doesn't do anything have ulcers? And so does the racehorse, because they're horses. <clears throat> You know, metabolic problems, those have became a big, big, big thing in the last several years. Um, people like their horses overweight a lot of times. You know, we all talk about body condition scoring, which, you know, what is that? It's a scale of one being emaciated and nine being obese. When I see most horses, I see them as sixes and sevens, a lot of eights anymore, um, you know, Metabolic problems too, diets that are high in sugars and starches and horses just not being able to utilize them properly because we've done a really good job of pasture management. We've done a really good job of feeding them. Like we've almost, we've done a good job in some of the problems we have helped facilitate. You know, when we get the metabolic problems, a lot of times, unfortunately, it goes hand in hand with the one beside it, laminitis. You know, there are a lot of things that can cause laminitis, your endocrine diseases, overfeeding of sugars and starches, toxins, uh, you know, unfortunately the horse getting in the feed room, you know, that's gonna throw that hindgut into a whole, a whole nother world. Um, you know, another common issue that some of us see are choke. Um, we've learned that dentition is huge for these horses. You know, they, they're living longer. I think people, don't realize that we lost my daughter's pony two weeks ago. He was 36 years old and looked fabulous, um, but just couldn't do it anymore. Um, you know, and then we can talk about parasites a little bit and the problems they are and how they've become and how, you know, for years we just used to do what? Deworm them, right? We didn't necessarily take the time to maybe do a fecal analysis. We just dewormed the herd. Well there's no more new dewormers in the pipeline, so we've created a little bit of a parasite resistance. So those are just kind of some issues. And again, they kind of all go back to, to our gut or our digestive tract. Um, you know, our essential nutrients, I'm sure you guys all know these, your water, your carbohydrates and fiber, your fat, your protein, your vitamins and minerals. You know, horses can go without a lot of things. They can't go without water, and they really can't go without fiber very well. Again, you guys can all read. I don't need to go through these, <laughs> but it just kind of gives you a quick, you know, again, water. When I work with kids, we talk about how important clean, fresh water sources are. When I work with adults, we do the same thing. You know, a lot of times when I get calls, that's the first thing we'll talk about is what is your water source? Because um, sometimes it's just not quite adequate. Um, you know, your fat, fat equals calories. Calories equal energy. Um, your carbohydrates, you know, a lot of people were on this no carb kick, can't feed horses carbohydrates. Everything we have has carbohydrates in it, guys. Everything. Can we lower them? Sure. But can we get rid of them? We really can't, no. Um, you know, protein. We've started doing just not body condition scoring, but you guys have probably heard us talk about top line scoring now. It's, it's probably new in what, the last five years maybe? Um, and we look at the condition on the wither. We look at the condition over the hips and we top line score them. And a lot of times that is lack of protein or lack of amino acids. Um, you've got your vitamins and minerals. You've got your fat soluble and your water soluble. Um, you know, 
vitamins and minerals are required for growth and development for healthy horses. But those are kind of our, our essentials when we start to, to talk about what helps keep everything going. And again, I can't say enough about water and fiber. Um, so uh, why do we offer our horses feed and supplements? This goes into what Amy's gonna talk about. Basically to balance their forage. That's the main thing we do, is we try to balance their forage. That is why we feed and put grain in a bucket. To get the deficiencies <clears throat> that the forage doesn't cover. <clears throat> this talks a little bit about photosynthesis. I'm not gonna go into this, but basically, the photosynthesis is what gives us the sugars in our grasses. So people will ask all the time, when do I graze animals that are sensitive to sugars? How do I soak my hay? Should I test my hay? Again, I'm getting into more of Amy's talk. Sorry. <laughs> Um, you know, some people will ask, what are the cereal grains? Well, these are the three that we tend to use for, that are in what we feed horses in this country. Um, barley, corn, and oats. Um, oats are gonna be the most widely used and probably what the horse likes the best. You know, um, they've got a nice fiber content it's usually a lower level of starch than some of the other cereal grains. But these are the three. If you're feeding a textured feed or a sweet feed, these are what are gonna stand out. Your corn, your oats, and your barley. You know, a lot of times people will say to me, so is the feed fortified? Is what you're feeding fortified and how, how does that work? Well, any commercially blended feed in this day and age is going to be or should be fortified. So it is going to have vitamins and minerals added to your corn, oats, barley, fat source. Now, just because it says fortified, is it fortified that the horse can use it? That's what we always have to dig into. Because again, we can make certain things out of our shoes and you know the carpet in there but it doesn't mean the horse can utilize it so it's one of those things where we, it has to be available or bioavailable for the horse so that's kind of um, fortification as as quick easy and dirty I mean you know So a lot of people will say, what's the difference between textured feed, pelleted feed, extruded feed, right? So this is kind of, again, a, a quick slide that we use a lot of times to talk about textured feed. Textured feed or sweet feed, what is it based out of? Corn, oats, barley, molasses, usually has a small pellet in there. That pellet's going to carry your vitamins and minerals. Sometimes it will have some yeast or some other other goodies in it, but that's what a textured feed's gonna look like, and that's what lots of people have fed over the years. The next feed is gonna be a pelleted feed or a cubed feed, and, and what's the difference? You can see in the metal scoop, I call those cubes. They're gonna have a diameter kind of like the size of your pinky, whereas a pellet is gonna be a smaller diameter. Most of the time, um, when we talk about a pellet in this day and age, they grind up whatever ingredients are gonna be put in it and then they put it through what they call a pellet die, which is a large circular piece of equipment and it pushes it out and then they cut it off with a knife and you get a pellet. Um, a lot of people that have older horses like pellets, most pellets mash well, which is kind of nice with water. Um, so again, pellets come in different different sizes, some people call them cubes. Sometimes when we all think of cubes, we think of hay cubes, the, the square cubes. But a lot of times people are referring to a pellet. They use them a lot 
out west because they go out on a gator or on a truck and they cut the bag and that's how they feed. A lot of broodmare farms um, up in this area will use them also just because they don't feed with tubs. So that's kind of the cube. Um, extruded feed. Extruded feed reminds me of dog food. Um, basically, it is ground up very small and it's put through a dye with pressure. And again, it has the consistency of dog food. The biggest thing, if you're feeding anything that is extruded, you're gonna to wanna to weigh it because it's big and fluffy. And what people don't realize, I mean, you should always weigh your feed anyway, but what people don't realize is that scoop of pellets is gonna be heavier than the scoop of extruded feed because it's very light. Any of you that use fat products, um, a lot of fat products are extruded um, and made into, like I said, it, it really looks, it has the consistency of dog food if you were to pick it up. Um, and then we have beet pulp based feeds. And beet pulp based feeds have become very, very popular. Um, beet pulp is a, a great source of fiber. It's, they call it the super fiber. Um, beet pulp years ago, people didn't know what to do with it. You know, it's, it's the pulp left over from the sugar beet. So they would just dump it like nobody knew what to do with it. I mean, there are stories of they said they used to dump it off the coast of California into the ocean. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but that's what they said they used to do with it. And then all of a sudden we found it was a really great, great source of digestible fiber in horses. You know, they say that it's, that it has close to an 80% of digestible fiber. So it's a very, very nice fiber source. And you'll see it a lot more in your feeds. Most of your senior feeds will have a beet pulp or a beet pulp base to them. A lot of horses that are ulcery, we talk about beet pulp based feeds or horses that have some muscle issues, we talk about beet pulp based feeds. So the non-structural carbohydrates, or the NSCs, I'm sure everybody here has heard about them, talked about them, asked about them, knows about them, right? So I get a lot of calls about these uh, on a regular basis from folks, most of the time that have older, overweight horses that are insulin resistant or um, PPID or have some form of a metabolic issue. So we're trying to get them off some of those high textured feeds and high starch feeds onto something that is a low starch feed or a low NSC feed, or sometimes just even a controlled feed. Um, so, you know, you can look real quick. Your high NSC things are your, your cereal grains, some of your lush or stressed grasses. Um, you know, your lower non-structural carbs are your diet balancers, your beet pulp, your fat sources. Most of the time when we test alfalfa, it has a lower non-structural carbohydrate than your grasses. Um, you know, your, your treats a lot of times have a high non-structural carb, and that's a real hard thing to explain to people that, no, you can't feed carrots or you can't feed apples because of these reasons, right? Um, and everybody has a little bit different of, of where, where is your mark, you know, you, your typical feeds are going to be over 21%. I mean, some of your textured feeds will be as high as 42% non-structural carbohydrates. Now, some horses can, can utilize that and do just fine. Then we have your controlled group, which has become probably a very popular group, um, as far as uh, feeding a horse. Um, and most of those feeds are beet pulp based, or they have some form of beet pulp in them. And then you've got your low, which is a 13% or less. Um, again, on the feed tags, a lot of companies are printing them and they will say you add your dietary st starch with your sugar and you will get your non-structural carb number. So that's how the feed companies are making it work. So I mentioned the balancers on the last one. There are a lot of balancers out there. As you can see, every company listed has one. What one does your horse like and prefer? 
They're created relatively equally. They are a good amino acid source along with all of your vitamins and minerals. I always tell people when they, they're talking to me about how, how to use them, what do you need to do? Think of it as a multivitamin with very few calories. So you have that fat horse in the backyard that needs to eat something to keep hoof quality, top line quality, all of those things. Here, here's your answer. You know, um, all feeding rates are a little bit different, but usually it's about one pound per thousand pounds of body weight, give or take, and it's gonna meet all their daily requirements for a maintenance horse. But again, take a look at the feed tag because they can be different. So I have a scale that I carry around with me a lot of times to weigh young growing horses and babies. But here's a quick way, and probably most of you have seen it, of how to weigh a horse if you don't have a scale. It's usually pretty accurate. You're gonna do the length and you're gonna do it from the point of the shoulder straight along the side to the horse's bum. Um, and then you're gonna take the heart girth, so the highest point of the withers. And basically you're going to do heart girth times heart girth times body length and divide it by 330. Now you can see that's a mature horse. You've got your yearling, your weanling and your pony. So that's again, just a quick tool when you're trying to figure out how much your horse weighs if you don't have a weight tape and you don't have access to a scale. I think the next one is body condition. So I mentioned body condition real quick. This can turn into a whole talk on its own. Um, a lot of times when, I call, when people call me and they'll say, my horse needs to gain weight or my horse needs to lose weight, what do I do? M one of my first questions to them is, what's the body condition score on the horse, you know? And we talk about that being one, which is completely emaciated, or nine, being so fat, you can see the fat pads all over them, and if it rains, water stays on their back with no problem. And I'm sure we've all seen some of those, those upper ones. Um, but these are the spots on the body, you know, we look at the neck, the withers, the crease down the back, can we see their hook bones around the tail head, across the ribs, behind the shoulder? And again, we like that five. And if you look at kind of a racehorse that's in good condition, a lot of times you can just see that very faint outline of ribs. That's a nice five. Again, like I said earlier, I tend to see the ones on the other side of that scale that we're always talking about diet balancers and how can we lose a few pounds. Um, so that is body condition <clears throat> score. Most of you guys know all of these. You know, we throw this slide in there, the tips for feeding. When you can, feed your hay before you grain. Don't feed big meals all at once. Try to break them up. One of my biggest things that I run into is wagging your feed. If it's not once a day, it's 10 times a day. How much does your feed weigh? Well, I have the blue scoop with the handle here and I think it's this and weigh your feed because again, your beet pulp based feed might weigh more than your extruded feed, might weigh less than your pelleted feed, might weigh more than your textured feed. So it's always good to know what your scoop weighs. Um, again, I'm a big proponent of testing hay, but Amy's gonna go into that. Um, you know, consistent feeding schedule, make dietary changes slowly. Um, you know, I always, we always talk about when we switch grain, how we do it, right? Oh, okay, if you're feeding four pounds, put one pound of the new to three pounds of the old, but everybody forgets what the main part of the horse's diet is, which is forage. So try not to run out of your old hay and just start with a new batch of hay, because that can be as much of a disturbance to that hind gut and that whole fermentation vat as changing grain too quickly. Um, you know, pay attention to, to dental and always monitor body condition score. I think that, better double check. Yes, I think that is everything. Does anybody have questions that I can answer? Where did... 
Uf, 